Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the third day of the talks and tours of Great Lakes Science Book, Science Book Camp. My name is Chow, and I'm the uh, plant sciences librarian at Purdue. So it is with great, great pleasure that I introduce our speakers for today's first talk, Dr. Anna Davis, Associate Professor of Mathematics at Ohio Dominican University, and uh, Dr. Sarah Finch, Associate Professor of Biology at Sinclair Community College. Uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. Finch will talk about librarian team up with faculty to reduce the cost of educational resources in Ohio. Welcome Dr. Davis and Dr. Finch, experience all yours. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I will share my screen in just a second and we'll get started. If I can find it. Um, is that the one? Okay. No, that's my email. I am sorry about this. I'm working on figuring out where my, where my tabs are. Here we go. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I think we're good to go. All right. Well, Sarah and I are here this morning uh, to represent the work of the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative. And our presentation is, is um, focusing on librarians teaming up with faculty to reduce the cost of um, educational resources in the state of Ohio. Um, I'm going to start by looking at uh, the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative and how this work began. Um, this all started with a $1.3 million grant from the Ohio Department of Higher Education. And the goal of the grant was to promote educational excellence and economic efficiency throughout the state in order to stabilize or reduce student tuition rates at institutions of higher learning. And what happened is there were several institutions that applied for this grant and three of those institutions were selected to be partners um, instead of having smaller grants awarded to individual institutions. And that's how the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative was formed. And here you can see all of the institutions that ended up being a part of it. Um, the initial three partners, the North Central State College um, was the lead institution on the grant. And of course, the Ohio State University and then Ohio Dominican University uh, partnered with North Central State College um, uh, to form the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative. We are also very pleased to have this many community college partners that provided really the backbone for this project. And we're also working with uh, Ohio Link and uh, of course the De Ohio Department of Higher Education. So let's take a look at um, the goal of this project, the project deliverables. Um, we are supposed to adopt, um, to create and adopt materials, open educational resource materials for 23 courses. And 20 of those courses um, ended up being um, kind of the, the main uh, graduation requirements that a lot of students take. So those are the high enrollment uh, courses, general education courses. And um, three of those courses um, are upper level mathematics courses uh, because that was the focus of the Ohio Dominican uh, University's application. Uh, but all three institutions ended up working on uh, all of those. And our goal was to reduce the cost of textbooks by at least 70% and uh, recoup four times the investment of the grant uh, over the course of three years. So here you see uh, all of the courses that have been developed as part of this effort. And I highlighted the courses that we'll um, talk about today. So linear algebra, statistics, uh, some more math courses, and of course the biology courses. Um, the reason these are split up into three cohorts is because we did not develop all courses all at once. Uh, we started with a pretty small cohort one and two. And uh, once we uh, really figured out what we were doing, this last cohort was uh, much larger than um, even the first two put together. 
Um, the way each course was developed was by forming teams of contributor, contributing faculty. And depending on the, um, the, the course and maybe um, like Calc 1 and 2 would be one team. And so that was a bigger team because we're essentially looking at two classes. Um, or perhaps a smaller one semester course that would require a smaller team. Um, so anywhere between four and seven faculty members per team. And every team was assigned a librarian uh, who was also an expert in the field. So um, teams were matched up with librarians with matching expertise. And uh, every team also got uh, peer reviewers, and that would be two or three peer reviewers per team. Those were faculty members who are also experts in the field and teach those courses regularly. So the way we got started is uh, these pictures represent pretty much the one and only time a lot of these colleagues got together in person. So these are our three cohorts that kicked off with a boot camp at Ohio Dominican University. Um, and you can see that Laura, really super large last cohort on the bottom. Um, these are some of our favorite pictures from the project because uh, we have everybody together pretty much one and only time that ever happened. Everything else was done virtually via Zoom. Um, and um, so all the team meetings, um, all the communications were done by email and Zoom, which makes this project kind of unique because we almost anticipated the pandemic environment and uh, figured out how to get this done without actually meeting in person. Um, to give you an idea for uh, who all participated in this, here is a breakdown, a bar graph of uh, participants by institutions. And you can see that community college faculty really made up the backbone of this project with 52 participants from community colleges. And uh, we also had private four-year institutions, public four-year institutions, and branch campuses of The Ohio State University. Um, so the, the numbers are broken down here. 37 different Ohio institutions are represented in total and 42 campuses. So this is really a statewide effort from all the corners of the state uh, representing different student populations, um, different types of institutions. Um, our goal for content development was to make content that is really flexible. So we gravitated towards modular course packages um, that are directly tied to Ohio Transfer Assurance Guidelines. Um, the Ohio Transfer Assurance Guidelines is a set of guidelines that Ohio faculty from multiple institutions with the help of um, the Ohio Department of Higher Education has put together for general education courses. And this way, anybody can go in and look at those documents and uh, really see if their course uh, fits um, those parameters, fits those guidelines. Those are very uh, well-developed learning outcomes. And um, this, um, if the course fits those guidelines, it is very easy to tra transfer from one, one institution to another. So we wanted to make sure that the courses we create fit those guidelines. And so our content was mapped directly to, uh, to those um, transfer assurance guidelines. Um, the other requirement was all content will be open access and free to students and faculty. So that was definitely a re licensing requirement. Um, as far as faculty teams are concerned, um, we had um, two requirements. One is that we have balanced representation of uh, faculty from different institutions on every team. So everybody brought their own unique experience. And um, uh, to, to speak about the teams that I worked with, we really did have very diverse representation. We always had someone from a larger institution, someone from a smaller institution, someone from a community college. Um, it, um, it really, really, um, expanded everybody's perspective on, uh, on the courses that we teach. And our second requirement was that the faculty end up adopting the materials that they develop either in whole or in part. So what are the deliverables for the faculty 
uh, projects. Um, the main content, so there has to be some kind of a course. It's we, we were not just developing extra materials for a course. There had to be um, enough materials to actually pick up and teach teach a course. Um, and um, those uh, that content had to be mapped to the Ohio Transfer Assurance Guidelines whenever applicable when those guidelines existed. But then we also quickly realized that a lot of what faculty are attracted to is not so much the textbook, but all the materials that come with the textbook. So there could be PowerPoint slides, there could be videos, there could be test banks, any number of those auxiliary materials uh, is what makes the class, uh, class materials so rich and attractive to both faculty and students. And so what we wanted to do is uh, replicate those publisher materials to some extent by collecting and creating auxiliary materials for our own projects. So things like lecture slides, test banks, in-class activities, worksheets were also created alongside um, the, the content that was either created or um, adopted. Um, our content for all of our classes is stored at Ohio Link OER Commons website. I'm going to click on the link and hopefully this technology will work for me. And there it is. It's coming up. Um, maybe. Um, the website is loading. I don't know what's going on here. Um, there it is. It's just very, very slow for some reason. So here we go. Ohio Link Open Course Content Library. If you scroll down, you can click on the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative Courses. And those My internet connection seems to be struggling a little bit. But um, if you do click on this and your internet works OK, uh, you will be able to see all of the courses that we have developed uh, displayed here very uh, neatly um, in a well-organized way. And again, the content that we selected and developed and all the auxiliary <laughs> materials are here. So well, let's see if you scroll down. Here we go. These are all the courses um, that were developed by the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative. All right. So I apologize, My you know, there's something going on. Okay, there we go, we're back. My internet is working. Okay, so the finished product here is a screenshot of um, uh, of a course. Uh, if you were to click on one of these courses that I just demonstrated, they would be broken out into uh, by topics. So these are kind of like chapters and then you can go in um, into sections and all of the sections contain the relevant material and all of the supporting materials. So that's just a screenshot of what you would find um, at Ohio Link OER Commons. All right, and um, at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Finch, who will talk about biology one and two. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having us here today. I'm excited to talk to you. Um, I just wanted to give a little background about Sinclair. I know a lot of you are from different states. Um, Sinclair Community College is um, in Dayton, Ohio. That's our main campus. We have five different campuses. Uh, between uh, Columbus and Cincinnati. We have about 30,000 students, so we're a pretty large community college. Um, and we have a lot of um, outreach into the local community. Um, we have a really robust, uh, what we call Center for Teaching and Learning. So I know most schools have those. Um, and our Center for Teaching and Learning is really awesome at giving us and providing faculty members with um, opportunities to create positive changes in our courses. Um, and one of the things that we really have focused a lot on is creating OERs. So this has been something that's been going on at Sinclair for probably about 10 years now. So we were getting into the game pretty early um, and we're really taking a big role. So we get these course revision grants if we apply for them. 
Um, and I was a part of that and was able to um, help create some of the open educational resources that we have. So this is just a screenshot to show you what um, our awesome librarians at Sinclair have created. So these are some of the classes and it's kind of small, but you can see that uh, these are some of the classes that do use open educational resources already. So wide variety of classes, uh, liberal arts classes, uh, science classes like biology, physics classes, um, communications, it's just uh, taking off dramatically. Um, and the book that you see at the bottom of the screen there is actually a lab textbook that I helped edit, which is an open educational resource as well. So we created that at Sinclair. Um, and this is a non-majors biology uh, lab book. So this is one of those things, if you're not in a um, science discipline, there often are classes that we would say are general education classes, classes that you know communication majors take. Uh, that would be our non-majors biology class. Um, and then we also have our majors biology classes as well. So that's uh, gonna be important for us to understand as we move forward. You can go ahead, Anna. Thanks. Um, so this is, again, when you go into Ohio Link and you're looking for open educational resources, um, in Ohio Link, you're going to find not only uh, the materials that were created from this collaborative, but also materials that have been created from other um, schools in Ohio, too. So this is an example, again, of that same uh, lab textbook, which I was happy to see is in uh, the Ohio Link. So anyone can use it. Um, it's a free resource. Um, and again, it's, it's a lab book for non-majors. So um, I think it needs some revisions and that, that's how OERs are really amazing. And, and we'll find that we can perform all these revisions. Um, but my goal is to get all of our Sinclair developed materials on Ohio Link, and that hasn't happened yet. So that's something that I'm working with our librarians on. So that's an exciting uh, piece of what we're moving forward into. Go ahead. So um, my involvement in the um, Ohio Open Ed Collaborative, um, I was in cohort three, so I don't think you probably remember all those classes, but um, I came in and the last cohort and everything was pretty well developed. Um, it, it sounded like there were some hiccups along the way in cohort one and two, um, but I was a part of developing the um, principles of biology one and two, and these are the majors biology courses. Um, this is a very well established series of classes. It's a two semester series. Uh, so you start with one and then finish with two, of course. Um, and the split is pretty typical in terms of how uh, the classes are taught. Um, so you start off with like molecular small things and cells and then in biology two, you move into larger things that you can see with your eyes. So like organisms and ecology and evolution and things like that. So that's kind of how the classes are divided. Um, but the, these two courses have very uh, robust tag. Uh, she talked about the tags. Um, the, so those are the outlines that you have to um, adhere to when you're teaching the classes. So uh, those have been in place for a while. There's uh, example um, course outlines that are used for these classes. Um, so they, again, are classes that are taught all over the place. And when you take them, they will transfer from one school to another if they're following tag guidelines um, and they will transfer as a majors biology course, which is pretty important. So if you think about a lot of community colleges, again, students are starting at the community college level and then moving on to a four year school, particularly if they're doing biology and then moving maybe into health sciences or medicine or something like that, it's really important that the biology classes that they take at our level do transfer, right? They don't wanna to have to retake uh, particularly, um, which can be a difficult class, these biology courses. Um, so these are the two classes. Again, this is just a screenshot of what the biology course content looks like when you move into it. Um, so there's the, the first class and then the second class as well. Go ahead. Um, so just to give you a little sort of workflow, how I uh, got into this and then how my experience with this. And again, it's going to be different for everybody that went through this, but uh, the opening meeting was really exciting. That was in January of 2019, which seems like several lifetimes ago at this point. Um, but it was nice. We got to meet everybody. Um, I was a part of a bigger team. So Anna mentioned that um, some of the uh, teams that had multiple classes to do like we did had larger teams. Uh, so we had um, either eight or nine faculty members that were on in our group uh, for the biology team. So it was really nice. We spent a good amount of the morning just getting to know each other. So, hey, I'm this person from this you know, university or college. And um, it was really exciting just to meet different people from around the state. So it was a really good opportunity for me uh, just to meet different people and, and hear their thoughts on how things are going. 
Uh, we talked a lot about the, the tag standards uh, for our classes, so we looked through those um, from the website. We all have been teaching these classes for a long time, but it was nice to sort of go back to that list and look at them. Um, we talked about what are the books that you use currently at your own institution. So I use this particular textbook. What do you use? Uh, thankfully, most people use the same textbooks. So that was actually a really nice uh, sort of consensus that we had at the beginning. Um, it doesn't have to be a, yeah, I was going to say, if you have questions, definitely let us know. Um, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be a roadblock if you have a group of people coming together that are using a different set of textbooks. That doesn't have to be a roadblock if you're moving into developing an OER, um, but it just became something that it was a little bit easier for us um, at the beginning. Um, we also then in that beginning meeting, we started looking at um, what are the OER textbooks that are already available. So if you do, um, there's quite a few what are called repositories for um, open educational resources, and these are just gatherings, and you probably uh, know this as a, a group of librarians, but the repository is going to gather up these open educational books that are already available. Um, so we did some searching and we found, um, let me back up for a second to, to tell you that again, I've been working in o, the OER um, area for quite a while, and I have worked with a colleague of mine who ended up actually being a reviewer for our project, which was nice, um, on creating an open educational resource for our non-majors class. So not only the lab book, but actually a textbook as well. So I've created a lot of those materials. So I came to this meeting having a good amount of information about what was available already. So what are the books that we have? Um, so I, I had been working on a non-majors. Um, and again, when you think about the levels, non-majors is just less detail, right? It's the same topics, but just less detail versus your majors. Um, and so when I came to this meeting, I said, okay, I've been using this textbook. This is a non-majors level. Let's look for a majors level. Um, and thankfully, OpenStax has a really nice biology textbook. Um, it's called OpenStax Biology 2E, so second edition. Um, and it is a remarkable textbook. Um, it has some deficiencies as all OERs do, um, but you're able to look at that and say, okay, this is a good starting place for us. And that's what we really um, found to be important. And then we just started uh, looking through the, the open educational, um, the, the biology 2E textbook to see, okay, what are the chapters that we really think we have to focus on? Because again, you don't always cover all the chapters in a textbook, right? And we didn't need to do that. So we spent some time mapping the tag um, out, outcomes to the, the chapters. And that's a good amount of what we did in that opening meeting as well. Go ahead. So one thing that we really spent a, a decent amount of time on, and I think this is something that a lot of people are really uh, thinking about, is what, what is the resistance for professors to use OER, right? The open educational resources. I think everyone in terms of people in higher education, we all understand that textbook costs are huge and that we're saddling our students with a good amount of debt um, because of textbooks. Um, and we, we don't want that, right? We, we, we remember paying for those textbooks, right? Paying off those student loans for a period of time. So we, we don't wanna do that to our students, but we're, as professors, I think a lot of people are leery of the quality of a, open educational resources. I think that's a, a major problem. So um, if you think about what are some reasons that you, know, you might not wanna use it. One thing again is quality. Is it um, for us in science, um, we need to have really high quality images, right? So a lot of our processes and things need to have images to help us describe them. And that's one of the things that I was really worried about in terms of looking at OER. Um, so that actually is something that I was able to work with um, librarians at our school and then also on the project and then um, also with some of our uh, course designers. So our instructional designers were able to help create images for us um, that were able to supplement what the OER did not have for us. So I think that was a really, um, really good in, in, it was very informative for me to see that we could do that. Um, but I think another thing is that a lot of professors are kind of set in their ways, right? They've been using the same textbook for years. The additions change, but you know, it, it's really just a few things here and there, maybe that change in the images. So professors have all of their tests put together. They have all of their PowerPoints put together. They have all their assignments and it's based on a textbook, right? That's what is the major uh, stumbling block, I think for a lot of people is that they don't wanna have to go back and reinvent the wheel, right? They don't wanna have to rewrite um, all of that material. I'm looking at a question. 
Uh, yes, we do have some crossover. Yeah, so we have some crossover, at least at Sinclair, and I know we do with the project as well that instructional design um, are often librarians. Um, so they have some background in both of those. Um, and we have had some movement from one direction to another at, at Sinclair specifically. So that's very helpful um, when we have our librarians that have expert content knowledge. And the librarian that I worked with on this project was a bi biology specific person. So when we were talking to her about uh, topics or ideas, she understood what mitosis was. She was able to help us you know, find the right resources. Um, I think that was really important. Um, we did go through a, a little bit of a class division. So we were looking at, okay, uh, there's biology one, there's biology two. And again, like I mentioned, there's specific areas uh, of those. We identified leads. So there was a faculty lead for each of the classes. Um, and then we figured out who wanted to work in biology one, who wanted to work in biology two based on what our, um, ex we were not experts, but what we were able to uh, really uh, explain very well. So each faculty member ended up having three to four chapters. Um, and it was nice because it was a really, it wasn't like somebody was grabbing on to one thing and holding on to it, um, we were able to come to a conclusion, hey, I studied genetics in college or in, in my uh, graduate work, so maybe I should do this genetics chapter. So it worked out really well um, when we were dividing things up. Okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no worries. Um, Sorry about that. My internet is just not doing what it's supposed to do. It's pretty slow. There we go. Is that the next slide? Yep, there you go. Um, so actually, I think there might be one more back. Can you go back one? There we go. Yep, there. Yep. So we also at that meeting decided what we wanted to provide in terms of um, what are the deliverables that we want to create for the uh, project. Um, so we wanted to make sure, and again, we were thinking about our professors, our biology professors who are entrenched in using their, their textbooks. And we wanted to um, create as many um, extra ancillary materials as possible, um, because that's a big problem, right? With a publisher, you get all of the test banks, you get all of the, you know, if you're thinking about using online materials, uh, the e-textbook, all of these things that you get as a professor, it's really nice um, because you, don't have to, again, reinvent the wheel. So we wanted to do that for them. Um, the OpenStax textbook that we use provides PowerPoints, which is fantastic. So we actually took those PowerPoints, downloaded them, and then changed them into what we wanted. So we, again, it, they were all lots and lots of words, um, but we would take those out. So we altered those, made those our own, and then uploaded those. Um, and we also wanted to um, we also wanted to, and I'll answer these questions in a second. We also wanted to create um, activities for each of the chapters too. So um, another thing that I've invested a lot of time in is um, the flipped classroom uh, style. So with a flipped classroom, you do a lot of uh, reading and studying before you come to class. You come to class and you work in groups on activities, lab projects, uh, group projects, research projects. Um, so I have already created a lot of this material for my classes. Um, so it was nice that I was able to just incorporate those. Um, and then we make sure that every chapter uh, with the tags was identified. So this chapter covers these two tags and here are the activities that you can use. And so every single um, chapter in our textbook had a, a specific set of projects that you could do, which is really exciting. Um, so we, we put all that together. We decided on a timeline. So here's the timeline for when we want to have things done. And then after we uploaded everything, um, we had to work on uh, formatting. Formatting was a big problem. <laughs> uh, not a problem, but it just took a little bit of extra time uh, just because everything had to be exactly the same for all of the chapters, which is great because you want the whole, you know, biology one to look the same, biology two to look the same. Um, so we had to make sure that we were using the, the same type font and the size of font. So the reviewers were really helpful because they were able to come in and say, oh, this doesn't look right. Or uh, maybe you should change the content, right? Maybe they had a, a, an idea for content. So they were very helpful um, in helping us to put another set of eyes on the work and say, yeah, this makes good sense. Or maybe you should try this or put this in a different place. So it was very, very helpful to work with those reviewers. Um, and then there, we also created a test bank. That's a big thing too. Um, so there were quite a few faculty that worked on putting together test bank uh, questions as well. So there's a huge bank of questions that can be used um, by the faculty members that are using this OER as well. 
you can go on and then I'll look at those questions. This is just showing you an example. This is one of the chapters that I worked on. Um, so this is showing you an example of what some of these uh, classroom uh, activities would be. So this is looking at DNA structure and function. So they're gonna be working on filling out a document. Um, there's a link that they can go to, um, again, if they have uh, a smartphone or if they have a computer in the class, or you could take them to a computer lab uh, to do this work because uh, it's a link. Um, and then there's a mutation analysis. I the think the most important thing to remember is that everything that we put together has to be accessible to everyone, right? So it's, it's a free open resource. But the major issue that we faced, and I think where the librarians came in, which is such a huge help, is that they know copyright laws, right? They know, okay, you can't use this image or you need to alter this image or you need to do this uh, sort of citing. So I think that was where I really had a lot of help from our librarian is like, okay, I want to use this picture. Can I? <laughs> right. And I started to learn those rules too, but I still am not an expert on all of that. And I think it continues to change. Um, so I think that was a really important thing is just making sure that what we were doing wasn't infringing on any copyright laws. Um, but there's a lot of great materials that are already put out there um, and it, you just have to sort of search for them. And I think really what is great about this is that we've put it all together now for these faculty members and we can say, here you go, right? And maybe they have other, other things that they can add to it. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about OER is that once you start using it and modifying it, you got to put it back out in the world. It's sort of a contract that you have when you create these open educational resources that, okay, I'll use it, but I'm going to fix it how I like, but I'm also going to share it with other people. So I think that's really important to remember is that the sharing piece uh, needs to sort of complete the circle for your OER um, that you are creating. All right, so let me look at some of these questions here. And Anna, you can help me answer these too if you want. Sure. Uh, let's see, class divisions. Yeah, so again, it's, yes, resistance to change is huge. Um, <laughs> at least it, that I found at my institution, we have a, a lot of professors who have been around for quite a while and it it's difficult to change, right? It, you've been doing something for a long time and you know that it works and you get great reviews on your class. So it is difficult to make those changes. There are some um, professors that we have that just will never accept this as a thing. And they are the ones that will be retiring at some point. And I think when we bring people in, then you know we're talking about, okay, OER is what we focus on and what we do. And it's something that we uh, really believe in in our institution. So I think that's one of those things that, you know, sometimes you just, you do your best to tell everyone about how great it is and show them the materials but not everybody is going to agree uh, that they should be using those things. Um, yeah, we, for us, for biology, we use the OpenStax content. Um, we didn't need to take it offline and make any changes. There were some, um, what we thought were missing topics and we created um, outside PDF documents for missing topics. So again, specific things that we wanted to cover that weren't in that textbook. Um, one challenge with OERs that I've found is that there are um, some, what, is, what am I thinking, software. There's software that you can use to actually modify uh, the PDF, uh, but Sinclair doesn't have this specific um, tool. And I think once we get it, then it's going to be a lot easier to take the textbook and put in the, the areas of things that are missing and how I want the order to be, and then I can republish it back up. So at this point, we're just using the OpenStax textbook textbook and then supplementing what we need to um, for that. Um, and Anna, if you want to go on, we can we can answer more questions at the end. Um, yeah, why don't we hold off um, on the questions because I think some of these questions are common to biology and mathematics. So um, I think I'm on the next slide, Sarah. So let's um, let's continue with that and we'll make sure to come back to all of the questions at the very end. Okay, perfect. This is just showing you another example of the that same assignment. So yeah, you can go on. Yep, I'm <laughs> fine. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. 
Um, so Sarah, did you, um, did you wrap up your presentation? Yes, I'm good. You can go on. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I'd like to talk specifically about the advanced mathematics courses. We have developed a lot of um, mathematics courses, primarily um, lower division mathematics courses um, that are general graduation requirements. Um, but Ohio Dominican University came into the grant and um, uh, our role was to really oversee the development of, of those three upper level mathematics courses. And these are linear algebra, abstract algebra and differential equations. And what's unique about these courses is that if you go to OpenStax, there are all kinds of um, textbooks for statistics and algebra and pre-calculus. Um, but you will not find um, textbooks for more advanced courses like linear algebra and OpenStax. So we had an extra challenge to work with. And of course, our librarian um, really helped us sort through this landscape and uh, come up with a, a very good solution for all of those courses. Um, so this is our workflow, very similar to what Sarah talked about in biology. Uh, we started out with just discussion and figuring out where all of us were coming from, what our backgrounds were, what our students were like, and what the needs are that are common to all of us. And then with the help of our librarian, um, we started looking at the list of texts. Um, and um, one of the interesting things about this project was that, yes, we did focus on OER, but what our real purpose was was to reduce the cost of education. So sometimes you actually have to think outside of the OER box to be able to do that. And uh, our librarian brought to our attention something that nobody has heard before. And that is that there are lots and lots of texts available for free from the library. And I don't mean a paper copy, I mean electronic copies that students can just check out and keep for the entire semester either as PDFs or in some other format. And this applies to textbooks. It also applies to other resources such as articles. And so we had that available to us as well as open educational resources. Um, so that really opened our eyes to the materials that are out there available to reduce the cost of instruction and at the same time, not make us rely on open educational resources, which might be a little scarce for some of the courses that are a little bit more obscure. And uh, of course, at this stage, we also discussed copyright information in a lot of detail. And again, our librarian for our team helped us with that. And we also had a librarian who was an expert in copyright, who was assigned to the entire project and was helping all of the teams navigate um, this, um, this really interesting and difficult landscape of copyright. Once we have identified the text that we were interested in, and we, we did have a mixture, we had some open educational resources, and then there were a couple of uh, free texts available through Ohio Links. So we have identified those um, texts, and we started thinking about what the gaps are and how we would start filling them. And most of the time, the gaps are not so much in content, but um, in areas like, I would really like a project. I would really like a hands-on activity for the students. So we have to think broader than just a list of topics, but think about the pedagogy and what am I gonna do with this in the classroom? And what are the students going to see? So it's not just about the topics. Um, the things that are missing could be um, broader than, um, than content. And then uh, we started filling those gaps. And um, again, this is where our librarian was very helpful because he helped us identify resources other than the textbooks. Um, there are video libraries and um, there are digital platforms that we could use. And mathematics is a very peculiar subject because um, we have notation that's essentially impossible to type up in, uh, in things like Word. Um, so we had to have um, very special tools to be able to come up with testing solutions. We could not just go with a standard test bank and say, we're just gonna write up our questions in a, in a standard text bank software. 
Um, and so our librarian was very helpful in identifying um, digital platforms that would be helpful to us. And here I have an example of um, the platform that we ended up using for two out of the three courses. It is called Chimera, X-I-M-E-R-A. And I'm not gonna click on this link because I know it'll freeze up my internet, so I'm gonna forego that. Um, but it is, um, it is a platform out of um, the Ohio State University. And uh, there is a presentation later today, I believe at one o'clock uh, by the developers of Chimera, which I would strongly recommend. And so they'll, they'll do a nice showcase of this system. But what's really nice about it is that it's, um, you can write your own content, uh, content in Chimera and incorporate um, machine graded exercises into it. And those exercises, um, students can type their answers in numeric, um, string characters, um, um, mathematical format, um, any of those inputs are okay. And so you can create pretty sophisticated um, exercise environments and content environments um, that do a wonderful job of not just delivering the content but testing the student at the same time so i would strongly recommend checking out chimera if anyone is interested in developing uh, mathematical uh, mathematics resources and again um, our librarian was familiar with that and so we were able to um, work together and uh, identify those um, additional resources and approaches to fill in those gaps so for the three courses that we developed, linear algebra, abstract algebra, and differential equations, we ended up taking um, slightly different approaches to each one. For linear algebra, we adopted two core texts, one of which ended up being an open educational resource, and one was a free resource available through Ohio Link. But we felt like those materials were not really interactive enough for us to be happy with them in the classroom. And so we ended up developing over 40 modules on Chimera. And again, the link I dare not click right now. Um, but um, those are the more modular variety. Um, so they're not like a textbook, but you can mix and match them um, and add them to um, any textbook in linear algebra as a supplementary um, set of content and exercises. Um, abstract algebra, we actually found a text that really fit the bill. It was an open educational resource text. And, uh, but again, we felt like it wasn't interactive enough. And so we ended up developing additional worksheets to go with the text. And those worksheets uh, were just pencil and paper worksheets. They're not uh, on Chimera. Uh, differential equations, um, we selected a very um, famous, if you will, open educational resource text, but uh, we decided to convert it to Chimera um, to add some interactivity and uh, develop um, a set of hands-on labs to go along with it. And uh, again, this is something that Sarah had mentioned earlier. The beauty of open educational resources is that not only do you get to use them for free, but you can edit them depending on copyright. Uh, you can edit them, remix them, make them your own, and share them again with the world continuing that cycle. And that's what we feel uh, we ended up doing for differential equations is picking a standard text, putting a twist on it, and sharing it yet again. Uh, so what made this collaboration work? Um, I think the faculty teams uh, were fantastic. It was great to um, uh, meet colleagues from across the state and uh, work on something we were all passionate about. But one thing I didn't really, as a faculty member going into this, that I didn't really have a full appreciation for is the involvement of the librarian in this process. And the librarian was involved with our team from the very first meeting. And um, Sarah had mentioned this, and we were equally fortunate to have a librarian who, who was also an expert in the subject matter. So we could actually engage in discussions that use our specific vocabulary, and he knew exactly what we were looking for. He knew what our sentiments were. And so it was really nice to have someone who understood what the, what the needs were and the instructional needs were. 
Um, another aspect of all of this is that we broadened our scope beyond uh, open educational resources and we considered other types of affordable resources such as free library resources and uh, multimedia resources online, uh, such as videos and things like that. And um, our librarian was familiar with all of those. And again, that really contributed uh, to the success of the project. Um, librarians' knowledge of other related projects. So we were not just involved with our courses, but our librarian knew about Chimera and um, it was uh, it was a really eye-opening experience to be connected with the Chimera team at Ohio State and be able to use those resources and uh, be able to use that platform. So just uh, his familiarity with um, other projects outside of ours was extremely helpful. And of course, copyright knowledge and resources. Our librarian uh, connected us with the copyright expert librarian who was working for the entire project. And so we were able um, to navigate that as well for some of the more difficult uh, copyright questions. So as we started looking back, um, I'm a member of the Ohio Open Ed Steering Committee and um, we continue to meet even now. And uh, just, lo just looking back um, on some of the presentations I heard recently, um, some of the things that really stand out as general trends that may not have been true 10 years ago. And that is libraries are more willing to stock textbooks. Somebody commented on it the other day, uh, libraries to, used to not really buy textbooks, but um, now there are different arrangements that can be made and um, um, digital textbooks. Uh, so libraries are much more interested in um, helping students out this way. Uh, librarians increasingly team up with instructional designers, and uh, I'm actually seeing that at my own institution, Ohio Dominican University. Our librarians are part of a team with our instructional designers. We have an OER librarian who works with an instructional designer all the time to help faculty bring these resources to life. Um, outreach programs are having a huge impact on faculty. And outreach is done by instructional designers, it is done by librarians, and it is also done by other faculty. And when we put our forces together, team up on this, um, the impact on faculty is really uh, very significant. But it's um, super important uh, to overcome that hesitancy by uh, teaming up with um, individuals across the institution, institutions. So it's not just librarians or instructional designers who are pushing for it, but a team that has everybody on it. Um, that makes outreach most successful. And of course, the pandemic brought digital resources to the forefront. And um, I have heard many, many individuals say that even though this was not the greatest time to get involved with uh, open educational resources, it was one way to go digital really, really quickly. Um, and so some faculty members actually end up going with OERs uh, because they needed something really, really fast. And I heard lots and lots of stories of librarians uh, working with faculty at the beginning of the pandemic just to fill those gaps that were um, left by going all digital. So this is the time to get involved with open educational resources because um, now we're all much more comfortable with um, digital media and digital textbooks and alternative methodologies. So um, thank you very much for um, uh, being here today. I would like to start addressing questions. We have some questions in the chat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna stop my share. Um, we can make this presentation available um, to anyone who wants it. Um, we have uh, links in our email addresses so you can um, reach out if you have any additional questions after the presentation. Um, but I'm gonna stop my screen share and I will open the comments and, um, and see if Sarah and I can answer most of these questions. Um, I think I saw one about um, competing with publisher materials. And I think that's definitely, um, like I said, 
you know, most of us have used publisher materials quite a bit. Uh, and I think that was one of our biggest challenges is what can we provide that is going to be at least comparable to what the, the publishers can provide. Um, so I think the test bank was a big part of that. Um, I know the publisher materials that I've used in the past have been like, um, again, interactive sort of activities or uh, quizzes that are adaptive, you know, like changing based on what knowledge they have and then going back and remediating questions that they, topics that they didn't understand. Um, so that's definitely something that we haven't quite figured out yet. But one thing we did too is in addition to classroom activities was created um, quizzes. So little mini sort of quizzes that are um, created by again, using test banks. Um, so that's helpful, um, but again, it's not a complete replacement um, for what publishers um, are creating. I think something that's interesting and we probably all have seen this is that a lot of publishers have uh, started to see uh, the, the emergence and the sort of taking off of OERs. So they're trying to get into the game too. And there are some people who um, I know have transferred from working in publishing to companies that are now working with OERs to create ancillary materials um, that they they still sell it, but it's much cheaper than uh, some of the publishers stuff. So that's a, a positive thing. I think we're moving in the right direction, at least in that way. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I see a question about OpenStax textbooks. So did you adapt the OpenStax content and move into a different book or format? Um, I'm going to answer that really quickly and then hand it back over to Sarah. Um, for a lot of the lower division math classes, we use the OpenStax textbooks. And uh, what our teams did is they uh, separated out the chapters or the sections that they really liked, and they extracted them out of the PDF and attached them to their own content. Uh, so there are two ways to go with this. You can just get the textbook, give it to the students, and say we're on page 10, and here is the book or you can extract the passages or the paragraphs or the chapters that you want and make them available separately. And I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah, see how they dealt with it. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. We didn't do that. We actually just used the textbook as it was and then created a PDF that was a supplement. Um, we didn't integrate it into the textbook. Um, again, I think it was for us, it was a software issue. So it was this issue of um, not having the correct editing software to do exactly what we wanted. Um, but we were able to do it in a way that I think it was pretty straightforward that, okay, this chapter uh, covers these tag, um, you know, outlines the course uh, outcomes. Um, so I think it, we, it worked okay. I think that we still would want to modify it and make it better uh, so that we could just extract exactly what we wanted, put our stuff in there and create our own version of this to upload. So that would be the ultimate goal, I think, uh, for this project is to, to create our, our exact copy of what we want. Um, yeah, it's an ongoing process. That's the thing. I think the beautiful thing about OER is that it can evolve and adapt. You know, you can change things from semester to semester. Hey, this topic didn't really work or, hey, look, there's a new paper, or a new topic. Um, you know, in biology, we got to talk about the pandemic now, this all, you know, all the virus and how does it work and how do vaccines work? So this is all extra stuff that we can add. And it's really easy to do that with OER. You're very, it's very flexible and adaptable. And I think that's really, really nice. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I see a question here um, about the incentive, incentive financial and otherwise to provide faculty and librarians uh, who participated. Uh, so this was done through a state one, a statewide grant. Um, so faculty and reviewers and librarians all received a stipend for their work. But of course, when they go back to their institutions, um, it kind of all falls apart eventually because the institutions have to start funding these efforts. And one of the things I, uh, I've been hearing recently is that um, there, is, um, there are funds available through the CARES grant uh, related to COVID. And a lot of institutions were able to take advantage of the CARES Act because uh, open educational resources are so friendly towards um, digital digitalization of education. And so a lot of campuses were being, um, are being able to um, utilize the CARES Act money to promote open educational resources as part of the digital effort on their campuses. 
Um, here is another question. Um, a lot of faculty were discouraged to create open educational resource content because they prefer the professional editing and formatting. Yes. Um, uh, so are there ways to reduce the workload when editing and formatting? Um, that is definitely a huge problem. And Sarah touched on it a little bit uh, when she talked about matching fonts uh, among uh, just, just the project participants. And of course, in math, we run into this all the time. Um, one of the ways that Ohio Dominican is addressing this issue is by having instructional designers work with faculty and incorporate the courses directly into the learning management system. And the nice thing about the learning management system is it already has format, uh, formats built in. So if you just put the documents in the right places, they tend to look okay. <laughs> And so that, that's how we've been handling a lot of these issues of formatting and making, uh, making sure things look uniform from course to course. And of course, once the shell is created, it can be copied for another course. Um, uh, so that's one way to look at it. But unfortunately, there is no magic bullet here. So <laughs> I'm not sure, Sarah, would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, that's that's the challenge that we face. Like I said, when when I started with OERs, I started on the non-major stuff, and I was doing this before I got involved with this project. And I went to um, my IT people, my instructional designer group, and I said, "Hey, I need this software. Do we have it?" And they're like, "Nope, we don't have it." And I'm like, "Okay, well, this would make my life really easy because all I need is this package, and I can, again, create my own textbook. I can." take this out, I can put this in. And, and there, it was just something that would have been really, really nice to have because I spent a lot of extra time trying to work around those issues. So I think that was a, a major hurdle, but one that I wasn't afraid to take on. I was like, you know, I, I don't care. I'm still going to do this. I still think it's important. Um, and, and again, it's not perfect, but it's getting to the place where the materials that I've created for this project and the other non-majors project, they're getting better and better, right? It, it just, my access to different material or software has been going up, which has been helpful. So it's just finding the time. I think a lot of you are talking about the the stipends and the incentives and and everyone is doing, you know, six jobs <laughs> um, as whatever role you play, you often have, you know, different things that you need to do. And I think that's the hardest part is just finding the time to do this stuff um, because we all know it's important. Um, but, you know, what is your time worth and, you know, what happens to the material afterwards and um, it can be challenging to make that call. Um, I think you have to be passionate about it because it is not a lot of money to do uh, the work that we're doing, but I think it's important work. Um, I think it has larger impacts in terms of saving kids money, um, kids, students. <laughs> um, I think it's it's really important work and I think we need to to take it to as many courses as possible and as many institutions. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll get to that place where students aren't spending $300 on a textbook that's not even a part of their major, right? I think that would be great, so. Yeah, so uh, there, there is one more question here about um, uh, students reacting to these materials, if there was any tension between incorporation of new quality resources and students' usage of course materials. Um, actually, um, there really wasn't. Um, almost surprisingly, students are very open to looking for their own stuff on Google all the time. And so they're used to seeing things in different formats and different classes use different publishers. So there wasn't really one thing that they're used to. Um, one thing that really helps with students is really advocating for open educational resources in a very intentional way at the beginning of the semester. And their appreciation for not having to pay for the textbook uh, really, really outweighed any little inconveniences that they might have ran into. Um, so just the desire of the faculty member to um, emphasize that and uh, help them out with whatever little difficulties they might have to technologically, I think goes a really long way towards uh, having students who are overall very pleased with the experience. And one thing too I wanted to mention is I when we started this again there in our non majors class there was a lot of pushback again from other faculty like no we've been using this textbook for 20 years we're not doing it. So we did a pilot of course you call a pilot a pilot and you can do anything you want for a semester um, and we were able to get 
and start gathering some data to show that the students who switch to using the OER textbook, um, they're not doing any worse. I was hoping they would do better, uh, but the grades look pretty uh, static in terms of the, who's using the, the publisher textbook using the, using the OER. Um, so there didn't seem to be any major changes, any statistical changes. Um, so that was great, right? And that was really important that we could show, hey, this material is not inferior, right? It's it's the same material, uh, similar material. I think it's really just a, a lot about the instructor too. It's about how they use it, how, how do they engage with it? Um, and in terms of students wanting to use it, I feel like as a professor at the beginning of the semester, you get to set the rules, right? Like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how we're gonna run this class and this is what's going on. And they don't really ever like push back. I've never had somebody say, oh no, I'm not gonna use that format or I'm not gonna do that because they they typically don't do that. So maybe that has happened to other people, but I've never had that experience. I just say, this is what we're doing. And they're like, sweet, let's go. So, yeah. Okay, I think we're at time and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Finch and Dr. Davis for your awesome presentation and thank you for taking the time in uh, sharing with us about your experience with OER and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. It was great. Feel free to email if you have questions or want to follow up or, or want some help with working on OER at your institutions as well. Yeah, definitely. I can, I'll type my email address here in the comments. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.